Hello, my name is Keshwani. That's K E S H W A N I, Keshwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GMAT. We have been solving GMAT math problems out of this book here GMAT Review, the official guide, the 13th edition. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. The book contains 230 problem solving questions. It has 174 data sufficiency questions. We have already solved every single math problem from this book. If you are interested in watching any of the original solutions to the problems, you will find the original solutions from day number 1 through 250. Right now we are in the middle of redoing the problems and we are on page number 286. Please turn to it. Page number 286, problem number 123 is what we are about to do. 100. And 23. Let's see what it has to say. In 123 we are told that the range of numbers in set S is X. We are also told that the range of numbers in set T in set T is Y. So we have two sets X set S and set T the range of the first one is X, the range of the other one is Y. So far so good. So far it's all quite very touching. Let's see what they're asking. We are also told that all the numbers, all the numbers in set T are also in set S. Now what does that mean? All the numbers that are in set T are also in set S. That's another way of saying, that's a pretty bloody awkward way of saying that set T, what this says is that set T is in fact set T is is in fact a subset of set S. That's all they're saying. Because everything that is in set T also belongs to set S. Set S therefore is a superset set T is a subset. So far so good. The question is very straightforward. The question simply is, is X more than Y? That's all they're looking for. Is the range of the superset, is the range of the set S more than the range of set T? Let's see what they tell us. The first one tells us that set S has seven members. And that's all they tell us, that set S has seven members. Listen, we really don't have to do anything at all here. We don't really have to do anything at all here at all if we are able to understand immediately that simply knowing the number of, number of members in a set, simply knowing that this particular set has seven members or six elements. By the way, sometimes they are referred to as members, sometimes they are called elements, and sometimes they are called... Uh, there is one more term that is used that hasn't come to my mind now. There is one more term that is usually uh, used uh, to describe uh, something that belongs to a set. They are referred to usually as elements or members. So simply knowing that this particular set has seven members or seven elements does not have anything to do with at all. That that information absolutely has no bearing whatsoever on the range of the set. We have to understand that the range of the set has absolutely nothing to do with how many or how few there are. For example, let me give you a simple example. We may have a set containing two numbers, 1 and 3. Well, here the range is 3 minus 1. The range is going to be 3 minus 1. Or, so simply knowing that set has two members does not tell us anything at all about the range. Or we could have had 3 and 3 million. Or we could have had a set where there are two members. One is 1, the first member is 1, the other one is 3 million. In which case the range is going to be 3 million minus 1. So the range has absolutely nothing to do with number of elements in the, in the set. But we're going to do it anyway. This information is useless. You're going to see that this, this first information, the first set of in, the information that is given in the first statement is not sufficient. Let me, let me show you with an example. So set, uh, set S has seven members, and then since set T, set, set, since the members in set T are also in set S, what this implies is that the set T must have, must have, seven or fewer members. Set T cannot have more than seven members. Seven is the utmost, uh, seven is the uppermost limit. Let's look at a couple of scenarios very quickly. I'm, I'm taking too much time here for no reason. 
here's the scenario number one. Scenario number one here is our set S. And it may have it uh, it's set S, we have one seven members, so it may have members such as one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. In which case the range in this case is going to be seven minus one, which is six. And set P might be set P might be set P might be just two just two members. It has only two members, one and seven. One and seven. In which case the range is also range of this this set, which is which is what they're calling y. The range of this set is also seven minus one, which is six. In which case x and y are equal. So the question was, is x greater than y? Here the answer is no. Another possibility is instead of rewriting everything, let me just do a second scenario. Another possibility is there is a scenario number two, where where the set one is same as before. Set one is same as before, but uh, let's let's do it here instead of rewriting everything. Here's here's scenario number two, where the only thing that I'm changing here, we have the same set S, but the set two has two members which are two and five. Well, now the range is seven minus two, which is five, and now the the, the x is x is six, x is six. In this scenario, the x is six and y is 5, the question is, is x more than y? The answer here is yes. We're just wasting time. This thing, this, this thing is not going to get... As I, as I already explained to you, simply knowing how many members there are in the set does not tell you any information at all, does not give us any information at all about the range of the numbers in the set. The first statement is not enough. A, D, B, C, E. A, D, B, C, E. Now that we established that the first statement by itself is not enough, we know now that the answer cannot be A or D. Now you do quite understand, I hope, you do quite understand, I hope, that all of this thing that we did here, we didn't have to make it so complicated actually. We could have kept it very simple. Here's a very simple, here's the simplest of scenario. And even though we, did, we are beating a dead horse at this point, I realize that. Here's the simplest of scenario. Set, set S has seven members and the seven members are one, 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 and one. Set T has two members and this in the, in the one and one. So in this scenario, in this case, in this case, x would equal y in this scenario because the range here is zero. X is equal to zero in this case. The range of x is zero and the range of y is zero. The range of second set is zero because it's just it's the all one. Uh, so in this case, is x more than y? In this case, the answer is no. X is not more than y. Here's another scenario. Another scenario is just that s has seven members. And the last member, instead of being 1, happens to be 1 billion. And of course now x is more than 1. You get the idea. Let's look at a second statement, shall we? What I was trying to point out is that the numbers do not need to be unique. Do you understand? That was just a extra work that we didn't have to do. We could have just kept them all 1. Let's look at a second scenario. Uh, second statement. Second statement tells us that set T, set T has six members. If six set T has six members, what this implies is that set S has at least at least six members. But again, all this tells us is the number of members in each of the set. It doesn't tell us anything about the range. We just saw it. Simply knowing the number of members in a set does not give us any information at all about the range. Second statement also no good. The answer is E. The answer is E. Let's move on then. Next problem, number 124. Number 124. In 24, in 124, we are told that he uh, gets paid, gets paid time and a half if the number of hours worked in a given week is more than 40. We are told that if we end up working for more, working for more than if, if we end up working more than 40 hours in a given week, then we're going to get paid time and a half for any hours that we work over 40 hours, which is a pretty standard practice. We are also told that on Sundays, on Sundays, he gets paid double time. 
on Sunday, he gets paid double time, which is also fairly standard in many of the places. I don't know about these days. I'm talking about 30 some years ago when I was an undergraduate. I used to work in a nursing home as a janitor. And actually, as a matter of fact, in that place on holidays, I remember on 4th of July, on Christmases, they used to pay three times your regular salary. Anyway, so on Sundays, of course, they, they paid twice your regular salary. The question is, how much, how much did he make last week? How much did he make last week? Let's find out, shall we? First statement tells us that his hourly wage, his hourly wage, which is what we're going to call it W, is ten dollars. He makes ten dollars an hour. Simply knowing that the guy makes ten dollars an hour, do you suppose it enables us to be able to figure out, to be able to ascertain uh, what what his uh, what his uh, income was, what his uh, well, how much he made last week? Of course not. Simply knowing how much he makes per hour doesn't. That is not enough. It's not a useless information. Of course, we might need it down the road. We will need it down the road, but it's not sufficient. A D. B C E A D B C E. Now that we have established, now that we have established the first statement by itself is not enough, we know now that the answer cannot be A or D. It will have to be B C or E. Let's go to the second statement. Second statement tells us that he worked a total of 54 hours. Worked 54 hours. And we are also told and never more than eight hours on any given day. Never more than eight hours on any given day. Again, before we before we waste our time analyzing this, before we waste our time analyzing this bit of information, the fact that he worked for 54 hours and never more than eight hours on any given day, we could actually analyze, sit there and analyze it. But first of all, right away we should realize that unless we know how much he makes per hour, wasting our time analyzing this bit of information is not going to get us anywhere. Second statement by itself is not going to do anything. We need to put the two statements together. So let's do that. Let's do that together. He has worked 54 hours. We know, we know that, uh, and never more than 8 hours in a day. Never more than 8 hours. We know that 8 times 7, 7 sevens are 49. 7 squared is 49. 7 sevens are 49. If you add one more 7 to it, 49 plus 7 is going to be 50 plus 6, 56. So that's 56. 56 would have been exactly 8 hours every day, all 7 days. In which case, in which case there would not have been any uncertainty at all as to how much he's going to get for that particular week. He worked only 56 hours, we are told, rather 54 hours, which means he worked 2 hours less than 8 times 7. The question is, on which day did he work two hours less? There are two possibilities. There are two distinct possibilities. One is this. Here is our, here are our day, Monday. Here are our days. Seven days of the week. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. That's one possibility. Where he worked eight, 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 eight Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then six hours. Another possibility is that he maybe he, he worked the six hours that he worked on Monday was work on one of the weekdays, Monday through Friday. As a matter of fact, they make no mention of the Saturday either, so it could be also Saturday. Let's pretend that he worked the six hours on Monday. In which case six will end up here and they will have eight, 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 and eight. And the problem is that here on Sunday he gets two times the regular rate, double time. He gets double time. Here he's going to get double time. Well, I'm making too much fuss here. Here he gets double time for six hours. Here he gets double times for eight hours. So the difference here is two hours. The difference is two hours. The difference is two hours. And the difference in hourly wage, listen carefully. And the difference in the hourly wage is, listen very carefully. And the difference in the hourly wage is that if he ends up working six hours on any of the other days, then we know for those six hours he's going to get time and a half because he's over 40 hours already. In a given week, if he works more than 40 hours, he's going to get time and a half. So if he works six hours on any of these days, Monday through Saturday, he's going to get $15 an hour. But if he worked, if he worked, uh, worked uh, on Sunday, he gets $20 an hour. 
So the net difference in the wage is only five dollars. So the difference is two the difference is two hours. Difference in hour is two, two hours times half his wage. Times half his wage. Half his wage, two two hours times half his wage is five dollars per hour. We cannot answer this question, how much did he make that particular week, because depending on which scenario you're dealing with, if he worked it on six hours, whether did he work the six hours on Sunday or did he work six hours on some other day. If he worked on six hours on Sunday, then his amount of money that he's going to make is going to be ten dollars less than this scenario. That's what it is, the difference of ten dollars. It's the difference of five dollars per hour, that's what it is. For this difference of two hours that we're talking about it, because he's, whether he works six hours here or here, whether he works six hours or here or here, in both of this scenario, for this six hours, he gets the regular fifteen dollars per hour, which is time and a half. The additional two hours that he worked on Sunday, you see, the, the, the difference of the two hours is what we're talking about. Because the other six hours, if he works eight hours here and six hours there, the six hours, this six hours already here, is the additional two hours that we're talking about. So the additional two hours, instead of getting time and a half, he gets two times the amount of money. So his time and a half would have been fifteen dollars an hour, two times is twenty dollars an hour. So he gets five extra dollars per hour for the two hours. It's a difference of ten dollars. We cannot figure out where those ten dollars is going to be. We cannot figure out his salary because of the fact that we don't know what's going on here. When did he work the extra hours? The first statement or second step? Oh, the putting the together is still not enough. Putting the two put, putting the two together is still not enough. The answer is E. I was rambling on and on for no reason. It's not. It's not going to get us anywhere. I thought we. Were, I thought we were still working on one. I thought we were still working on one or the other statement. We are at the end of the story actually. Putting it together still doesn't get us anywhere because we don't know where he worked the six hours. Let's go to the next one. Enough of the clock here. Number one hundred and twenty-five. Number one hundred and twenty-five. In 125, we are told that we have a red marble, we have a white marble, we have a blue marble, or chips if you like. The question is, what are the odds, what are the odds that if we were to pick a chip at random, what are the odds that a chip, a chip, picked at random is either white or blue. What are the odds that if you were to pick a chip at random that it will turn out to be either a white or a blue chip? Let's find out. Now, before we look at any of this, any of the information that is given in the, those two statements, let's make sure that we can articulate it properly in mathematical terms. What are the odds that the chip picked at random is either white or blue, which is Sam is saying, what is the probability of picking a white or a blue? Which is Sam is saying, the probability that a chip that you picked is either white or blue is Sam is saying, what are the odds of not picking a red one? This is Sam as the odds of not picking a red one. Because if you did not pick a red one, if you did not pick a red one, then you must have picked white or blue. So, if you can figure out what are the odds of not picking a red one, then that's, that's the exact same we answered the question. Those are the odds of picking a chip which is either white or a blue because we didn't pick a red one. The odds of not picking a red one, the odds of not picking a red one, in turn, is equal to 1 minus the odds of picking a red one. That's what it is. So what we have to figure out is this guy right here. 1 minus the probability of picking a red one. If we can figure that out, we can answer the question. Let's see what they tell us. The first statement tells us that the probability of picking a blue one is one-fifth. Well, the probability of picking a blue one is one-fifth is great, but that doesn't get us anywhere. That doesn't get us anywhere. Now, if we knew the probability of picking a blue one and if we knew the probability of picking a white one, then we could have gone somewhere. If we knew the probability of picking a blue one and the probability of picking a white one, we can figure, figure out the probability of picking a red one and then we can answer the question. But simply knowing probability of picking a blue one is not enough information. This first statement does not provide us sufficient information. A D B C E. Now that we established that the first statement by itself is not enough, we know now that the answer cannot be 
A or D. It would have to be either B, C, or E. Let's look at the second statement. The second statement tells us that the probability of picking a red one is one third. Well, what do you know? That's it, we are done. If the probability of picking a one, uh, red one is one third, then probability of not picking a this implies that probability of not picking a red one is two thirds. Oh, that does the job. That was too simple, actually. The answer is B. The probability of picking a chip that happens not to be a red one is two thirds, which is the same as saying a chip that happens to be either white or a blue, because it's not a red one. Let's go to the next one, number 126. Number 126. Number 126 says that we have sold 400 tickets. We are told that some are sold at full price. Some of these 400 tickets are sold at full price. Let's designate the number of tickets that are sold at full price. Let's designate those, that number with letter F. So in our discussion, F will represent the number of tickets that we sold at full price. And of course, some are sold, some are sold at discount. Obviously, by definition, it's axiomatic. It is a tautology. We'll talk about these two words in a second. If we sold, if we are told that we sold some at full price, well actually this is not, now that I just realized it, it is not axiomatic and it is not a tautology. I, I caught myself because I was about to say that if we sold some, if we are told that we sold some at full price, then obviously it means that we must have sold some at a discount. No, there is a third possibility which is we gave some, uh, we gave some free, we gave away some free or we may not uh, so sold them at all and there were seats were sitting empty so there are a whole bunch of possibilities ignore that so anyway unless they sell us let me read the question properly let me read the question properly they must have covered their dirty air because this leaves it too wide open what was the revenue that a theater received from the sale of 400 tickets some of which were sold at a full price and the remainder ah oh, and the remainder not some but the remainder and the remainder so were sold at discount. Well, that makes our life easy. So if the remainder were sold at discount, what's the remainder? Well, if there are 400 total that were sold, then the remainder that they're talking about at discount, this is how many we sold at the, at the, at the, at the discount. 400 minus F. Whatever number of tickets we sold at a full price, minus take, we take that away from the 400, that, that difference is how many we sold at a discount because we are, we are told distinctly that the remainder were sold at, at a discount. In other words, we did not give any of, any of them away free and there were no unsold ticket uh, not uh, where seats were empty. You understand? Of course they could have covered them themselves. I caught myself because otherwise the plot was thickening too fast. Do you understand? These problems, you have to understand you have to understand that these problems are not that complicated. They don't, they don't, they don't uh, introduce such uh, complications of the real life, you understand? The question is very simple, what's the, what's the total revenue? What is the total revenue? Let's call it R, and the question is how much is it? But how do we find total revenue? Before, you do, before we do any work at all, before we do any work at all, it is after all a test that you're going to take to get in the MBA program. We have to know how to state our revenue function. Well, the revenue function is very straightforward. The total amount of revenue that we're going to generate is the number of tickets that we sell at a full price, which is F, times the full price, plus the number of tickets we number of tickets we sell at a discount, which is this right here, 400 minus F, times the discount price with the subscript D. This is our revenue. P with the subscript D is our discount price. That is our revenue. And, that, and they're, asking, they're asking the value of this guy. 
Can you see immediately what sort of information we need, what sort of what bits of information we're going to need? There are three bits of information we need, otherwise we cannot answer this question. There is no way we can answer this question unless we know how many tickets were sold at full price or how many were sold at discount. Because if we know how many sold at discount, we can figure out the full price. But anyway, that's the third bit of information we need. We also need to know the two prices. We need to know what was the discount price and what was the full price. If we do not have these three pieces of information, we can't go anywhere. We cannot go anywhere. Okay? There are, there, are, there, are, there are three pieces of information we need. We need to know the prices. Let's call this one. We need to know the discount price, which is bit second information. And then we need to know either the number of tickets that were sold at full price or the number of tickets that were sold at discount, one or the other, which is what I'm calling third bit of information. Let's see what the first statement tell us, tells us. Let's see what the first statement tells us. The first statement tells us that one-fourth were sold at full price. One sold were sold at full price. The amount the, the one fourth were sold at full price, which implies that three quarter, three quarter were sold at discount price. This takes care of this takes care of the third bit of information. Right here, third. We know now how many were sold at full price, we know now how many sold were discount. But it doesn't mean it is a where is where, where is the where is the one and where is two? We do not know the prices. The first statement does not give us the prices. The first statement by itself is not enough. A D B C E. We do not know the prices. We do not know the discount price, we do not know the full price, and we need to know the prices. Now that we established that the first statement by itself is not enough, we know now that the answer cannot be A or D. Let's look at second statement. Second statement tells us that uh, full price, the full price is twenty-five dollars. The full price that we're talking about is right here, which is the, which is a, which is our part A, uh, first bit of information, right here, first bit of information. Well, second statement tells us the first bit of information. What about what about the second bit and the third bit? We know the full price. We still do not know the discount price, and we still do not know how many were sold either at a discount or a full price. So second statement by itself is not going to get us anywhere. As you, as you can immediately see what's going to happen. You can immediately see what's going to happen when we put the two information together. Now we have number three. Now we have number three. Let's, let's put them in here. One, two, three. So when we put them together, one, two, and three. Now we have number three, which comes from the first statement, which comes from the first statement, and we have number one which comes from the second statement. But we still do not know the second bit of information, which was the discount price. Where is the discount price? What is the discount price? Until we know the discount price, we cannot figure out the amount of total revenue. The amount of total revenue, I can't believe I just said that, it's, a, it's a redundant. We, until we not know the discount price, we cannot figure out Actually, it's okay. Amount of total revenue. That's okay. We don't have to be so pedantic. That's it. So, putting the two statements together also does not get us anywhere. The answer is E. The answer is E. Now, listen, since these words did crop up, let's cover them very quickly. Pedantic actually happens to be on day number 69. Day 69, we learned that word. Let's learn about tautology and, and axiomatic, even though. I realize that it did not apply there because they covered their their year. Day number 38. If axiomatic is day number 38, then I can guarantee you that we also learned the word tautology on the same day because they go together. What do you know? It is day 38. If you're interested in improving your vocabulary, and I see no reason why you would, why you wouldn't be, go to the well. You are at the uh, you are at the YouTube. Uh, search, just type in, just type in GMAT vocabulary words, GMAT vocabulary words, day 38. And you will see the video where we learn these two words. And then type in GMAT vocabulary words, day 69, where we learn the word pedantic. I'll see you tomorrow, okay? Bye now.